On today's show, the Atlanta Hawks go up to Madison Square Garden and lose by 24 points in pretty surprising fashion on this Wednesday evening. DeJounte Murray goes down in the opening minutes, leaving the Hawks even more shorthanded. And basically, this game came down to uh, some pretty lopsided three-point shooting. The Knicks were red hot, the Hawks were ice cold, and the results followed. We'll get into all that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1364 of the Lothan Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you on a Wednesday evening, December 7th. This podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can have a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That is prizepicks.com slash locked on. And today's episode is going to be diving into what became a pre lopsided defeat for the Hawks up at MSG in New York. 113 to 89. If you didn't watch this game, uh, the simple version was that the Hawks could not make jump shots, and the Knicks made a lot of them. Now, there were other things involved. It's never as simple as one thing swinging a game, but this was certainly one of those nights when the Hawks just could not make a three and the Knicks shot above their heads. And I previewed the game on my Patreon at patreon.com slash BT rolling. And one of the bullets or one of the sectors that I wrote was basically that these two teams are both bad right now from three-point range. And basically whoever made more threes in this game was going to have the leg up. And that's very simple analysis, but at the same time, it ended up being the Hawks – and Knicks took the exact same amount of threes in this game, 36 each, and the Knicks outscored the Hawks from three by 33 points. And there is your basketball game in a lot of ways. So we'll get into all of what transpired. An injury to DeJounte Murray as well was definitely uh, looming over things. He, got, he went down in the first quarter, as we'll touch on in a second. But with this loss, the Hawks have now lost five of the last seven. No one is feeling good at this point, I'm sure, around the Hawks. They're 13 and 12 still, so the record still looks in decent shape. But, uh, you know, two and five over seven game stretch is not what you want to see. And the Hawks did have a, a nice flash at the end of the first half when they were trailing by a lot of points, threatened to kind of replicate what happened the first time in New York when the Hawks were down by 23 points in the first half, only to come back and win by double digits, actually, in that game. But in this one, the momentum stopped and the Knicks made shots, and that was the end of that. So coming into the night, the Hawks were facing a Knicks team that was just middling, basically. Below average defensively, a little bit above average on offense, including some good offensive rebound numbers, but nothing spectacular. And as I said a second ago, neither team making threes at all and not taking a ton of them either this year. Notably, the Hawks were the more banged-up team injury-wise. John Collins is still out for the Hawks. DeAndre Hunter, who did make the trip uh, and was on the bench, was uh, is still out for the Hawks as well, along with Trent Forrest. And then Murray went down in the middle of the game. Uh, the Knicks had one injury during the game. It was Obi Toppin went down, but they were uh, basically at full strength in this one, which is definitely a big factor, especially playing in front of their home fans. And the Knicks basically led, I don't know if that was the entire game, but it was certainly the vast majority of it. They scored the first few possessions of the game to lead 7-2. to two. And then within the first four minutes, DeJounte Murray uh, is slow to get up after he gets fouled on a jump shot. He was limping around very quick, quickly um, with the ankle. Uh, you saw it on the replay. Um, just what, looking at it, it looked like a traditional ankle sprain, kind of like what happened to Collins in different circumstances, but certainly a similar-ish looking injury. With ankles, you never know how long they're going to be out. But uh, he did stay in for a few seconds, waved off a sub at one point when his sub went to the table. But uh, he stayed in, shot free throws, but he was not able to continue. And then he was originally listed as questionable to return with a left ankle sprain and then quickly ruled out by the Hawks just a few minutes later. Um, they went to Aaron Holiday, and I actually thought that Aaron Holiday might not have played in this game based on the rotations that have been happening so far. In fact, he'd been out of rotation in four of the last five games for the Hawks, but with Murray out, he kind of has to play. And uh, Nate usually likes to defer to uh, keeping his rotation plan in place when a guy goes down early, early in a half. So basically, you, you just kind of put Aaron, all, Aaron in and leave Bogey in his role, et cetera. Um, I'm not convinced that Aaron would have played this game overall, but the Hawks had to go very deep into their bench. In fact, in the competitive portion, the Hawks had 11 guys play, and they only had 12 guys active in this game. So basically almost everyone played, and then by the end of the game, Kaminsky was in there in garbage time. So as for Murray, like we don't know anything else right now. Um, McMillan said there was some swelling with Murray's ankle. Um, but you kind of never know what, how it's going to respond. Obviously with Collins, they immediately ruled him out for at least two weeks. Um, ankles can be tricky. He, he could be back in a few days. He could be out for a few weeks. We don't really know. We won't know until they get an MRI on it. So uh, the Hawks are staying in New York tonight uh, and to play on Friday. So we'll maybe get an update as early as Thursday. The Hawks were down 18-8 to eight out of the gate uh, in the first six minutes. Jalen Johnson got in foul trouble as he was the entire night. Nothing had gone well at that, at that point in time. The Hawks were missing shots. Murray goes down, fouls, everything. 
and the Knicks led by 12 mid-quarter, prompting a timeout. New York had 25 points in the first eight minutes. They opened 5-6 from three, and that was a continuing theme of the night. Even Julius Randle, who is not necessarily having a great shooting season, he made a bunch of jump shots in this game um, rotationally for the Hawks. It was the similar um, alignment in some ways, but also had, they had, had to be different in some other ways because of all the injuries. Uh, Bogey came in. Played his usual, um, at least the last couple of games, his usual alignment. Akangu was the backup center. It was Justin Holiday returning to action in this game. He originally came in before Bit Krejci did, and then Bit came in a little bit later. Um, Trey played the entire first quarter with DeJounte sideline. That's not been the case all the time, but with DeJounte out, that's kind of what the uh, old rotation looked like for the Hawks before they actually had DeJounte Murray to go to. And Atlanta was done by 14 points in the first quarter, settled in at 31-20 at the end of the first. And basically, it was all jump shooting. The Knicks, in a, uh, a window into, into what was to come, they shot 5 of 13 on twos in the first quarter, which is really good defense and really good challenging of shots. But they were 6 of 9 on threes and had no turnovers. And that is going to be a bad recipe. Hawks offensively could not make shots either from three-point range. They were 1 of 9 from three in the first quarter, and that did not stop, uh, let's just say. Um after that, we'll get into like all of what transpired with regard to uh, the rotation and the one run the Hawks did have, which was a 17-0 run in the second quarter. I promise that was definitely the highlight and really the only highlight of this game. But before we get into all of that, as well as uh, our usual breakdowns of what, the, of what the team accomplished in this one and our individual bright player evaluations, it worth more sponsors on today's show. Today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. If you're looking for a daily fantasy option this year or really on anything whatsoever, NBA, across the sports world, check out the warming app at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. I love it. And I know that you will too. It's so very easy to use. I can vouch for that. It is awesome to play with. I've been doing it for quite some time now and really enjoy the daily grind going through all the numbers. And all you have to, pick, all you have to do is pick two to, seven, two to six players, I should say, and choose whether they have more or less than a certain number of points or rebounds or assists or steals or whatever you like to look at on the stat sheet. And at Price Picks, what up to 25 times the money on any entry that you do, just you against the projections, and it's just that easy. They offer sports across the board, NBA, college basketball, WNBA, NFL, college football, MLB. They have PGA and NHL and soccer, esports, and much more. Entry can be done just in just a minute or less. It's that easy, and it's that quick. And Price Picks has safe and fast withdrawals, and they're available in 30 states at this point as well as uh, that also includes Georgia, I should say, and they're in Canada as well. Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. And when you get there, use the promo code Locked On. If you are a first-time user, 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. Do not forget to enter that promo code Locked On and sign up for the instant deposit match up to $100. Check it out now at PrizePix. All right, we'll dive in now to the second quarter and beyond. And basically, uh, there wasn't a whole lot to write home about in the second half, so I'm, I'm cutting, cutting, out, cutting out the show here a little bit earlier than usual and uh, diving into uh, the three quarters kind of jumbled together. Um, the Hawks played 11 guys in the first 13 minutes of the game. With Trey sitting, they had to play uh, Aaron Holiday and Big Krejci for ball handling along with Justin Holiday and Okongwu. Beat had a pretty rough few minutes when he first came in. He was very jumpy, had two quick fouls, had a turnover. He, he still in, was better after that, but it was definitely noticeable that he was kind of out of his depth early in that second quarter. The Hawks went down by 18 points after a 7-0 run by the Knicks. The Hawks didn't score for more than three minutes. They only, only attempted two shots in that stretch because they had three turnovers plus some offensive fouls and all, all kinds of weirdness there. But then, again, the Hawks had their one big run. It was a 17-0 run. So the Hawks lost this game by 24 points and on a night when they actually had a 17-0 run. So that's pretty crazy. They were outscored by 41 points the rest of the night. Um, they got back within one and had a chance to tie it and, and take the lead a couple different times. Uh, the Knicks finally had their worst and only really bad shooting stretch of the entire game. They missed seven straight shots, three turnovers. They didn't score for like almost five minutes. Finally made a three after that. But the Hawks used some zone effectively, defensively during that stretch. And it was with the bench unit. And they were kind of just making shots finally and also getting stops at the same time. Um, Jalen Johnson came back in briefly, got a third foul, came right back out. And he was basically unable to sit on the floor the entire game. By the way, he ended up fouling out in, in 14 minutes of play. Um, they went to, in a kind of a weird um, look into how dire things were rotationally, the Hawks played a Kongu and Capella together twice. And that basically almost never happens. It's played, I, I think they've, they've probably done it maybe twice ever before tonight. And they did it twice in this game because of all the foul trouble to Jalen and all the, 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 the sort of the rotation was jumbled up. And honestly, if there was ever a night to do it, it would have made sense because the Knicks, number one, usually play two bigs. Also, the rotation was just completely jumbled up the entire night. As soon as Murray went down, they had, they had, to, they had to sort of you know mess with everything. And then without Collins, they don't have a lot of size. And then Jalen's in foul trouble. And it was like, all right, let's we'll, we'll just do this now. And it didn't kill them. It was just kind of interesting that they finally did that. Um, 
The Knicks did have the late run, though, 11 to 2 to go back, back up by 10 points. The Hawks only had two points in like a four minute stretch after that one big uh, binge of scoring. It was one of eight from the floor with a turnover in that dry spell, and they were down by 12 at the halftime break. But after all that, to be only down by 12 was kind of, uh, you know, not that bad, honestly. It was a very big roller coaster in that first half. The Hawks shot 56% from the floor, uh, sorry, on twos in the first half. And uh, that was a pretty good process. They had six turnovers. A lot of things went well. They just didn't make shots. They were two of 18 from three in the first half, including one of 12 from the three best shooters on the team, Trey and AJ Griffin and Bogdan Madonovich. That's tough to do. Um, And basically the defense got blitz from three, but they held the Knicks in check from two all night long. And that was the case throughout this game. Um, as for the second half, it was Aaron Holiday and DeJounte Murray's place. They were able to get to the rim a lot early. I, thought, I actually thought it was pretty notable to me that the Hawks were attacking effectively, getting to the rim in the first few minutes of the third quarter. Jalen Johnson's best play of the night was a three-point three play on the first possession after kind of a lost half for him in the first half. Trey got fouled once, set up Capella twice, four easy buckets, but they couldn't get stopped because the Knicks made two more threes, and it was back up to 13-14 you know, in a hurry. There was a nice driving kick moment from Trey to A.J. Griffin, kind of knifing to the rim for a, a nice little bunny at the rim. But other than that, Jalen got two more fouls, had to come out of the game. He had five fouls in 12 minutes. The Hawks were in the penalty with eight minutes to go in the third quarter. Just lots of kind of a sluggish kind of period. They went to Krejci for some backup minutes and gave up 36 points in the third quarter because of all the fouls and three-pointers from the Knicks. They were down by 17 with five minutes to go. Um, there was a one – I'll just say this. The officiating was not great in this game overall. Perhaps the most notable bad call of the night was a R.J. Barrett layup that was counted – on a continuation that I don't understand, and I don't think anybody did. In fact, they ended up with a technical foul by Trey Young. The entire bench went crazy when they when they counted the basket. Obviously, it didn't change the game, but it was one of those things that was kind of just a funny observation as to how bad that call was. A couple of plays later, though, was the play that I kind of circled on Twitter as the microcosm of the night. Obviously, there were multiple examples of this, but the one that I kind of dwelled on for a second was that Trey had a great pass to A.J. Griffin for an open three in the corner that he missed, which is just a, a normal play. Then the Hawks got an offensive rebound. Kicked it, it went to Trey, kicked it out to Bogey for an open three, and he missed it too. So basically the two best shooters on the team, the two wing snipers, both had open looks on the same possession. They both missed, and then Nick scored on the next possession, and it was a five-point swing. And that was kind of the it was kind of just how, how this night went for the Hawks. And there was an 11-2 run at the end of the third quarter by the Knicks to kind of break it open for good at 89-65. to The Hawks missed six straight shots at one point. The Knicks made six of their first 10 threes in the third quarter, and they were down by 22 at the end of the third. And um, as I said um, at the time of the podcast, the Hawks were minus 33 from three-point range at, for the full game. That was also the case through three quarters. The fourth quarter was just kind of a pointless uh, you know, garbage time effort for 12 minutes, essentially. But – through three quarters, the Knicks were 14 of 37, sorry, 14, 14 of 31 from three, and the Hawks were three of 26. Yes, three of 26. In the fourth, they got it to 20 very briefly on a McDonald's bucket with like 11 minutes to go. But then it was back to 26 kind of immediately. Um, it was in that range of like 23 to 26 for a long time. Trey Young was going to check in the game. He was actually at the table. And uh, they went into a timeout down, I think, like 24, 25. And Nate decided to pull him off. I actually said that in the moment on Twitter as well, that I would not have put, Nate, uh, that would not have put Trey back in. And they didn't. That's how well, I tried to play 30 minutes. But um, that was the white flag. They put Kaminsky in. It was basically full-on garbage time after that, even though it was basically over already at that point. As for kind of what transpired here, the numbers are as bad as you would think. But once again, process-wise, it wasn't so bad for the Hawks um, as far as you know how things were. Um I'll say this. I, I, I like to frame things this way. Every once in a while, I make people's uh, brains kind of turn on. If all I told you in this game was the Knicks would shoot 43% on two point attempts, that's terrible. League average is like in the low 50s, mid 50s. 43% on twos. They had 36 points in the paint. That would be like a league average, uh, sorry, a league worst number. Um, if, I, if, that, if that's all I told you was that they were going to do that and the Hawks were going to shoot basically league average on twos and have 11 turnovers. The Hawks would have been at least in the game, if not winning the game. And the Hawks lost this game by 24 points because the three-point line was that lopsided. But again, credit to the defense on some level. They weren't perfect in this game. I don't want to, I don't want to overstate it. So I'll say this now just to be very clear. The Hawks did not play that well in this game. I'm not saying the Hawks played great or anything. They're obviously a very weakened roster right now without th- basically in this game, three of their best players. Um, you could certainly argue like how good Hunter has been at times, but you know, Murray and Collins are two of their best four or five players, full stop. Murray's the number two guy on the team, et cetera. They were out plus another starter in Hunter. Uh, that's a huge loss that like basically any team would be hampered by that consider- considerably. 
Then you throw in the fact that the Hawks are, as I've been saying since the summer, pretty shallow in terms of their roster, in terms of their effectiveness on this roster, and then it gets pretty ugly in a hurry. So they didn't, they didn't play great. But the fundamentals of the roster, uh, sorry, of, of the stat sheet in this game were like not bad at all. It was that they just three point, the three-point line just swung things uh, in a lot of ways. So, again, they held the Knicks to 43% shooting on twos. That's a terrible number. The Hawks did well at the rim, but the Knicks shot the heck out of the ball. They were 17 of 36 from three. That's 47%. The Knicks came into the night with the worst three-point shooting mark in the entire league. Julius Randle, who is not a good shooter necessarily, was 6-12 from three. Even their bench guys got into, the, got into the act. Now, obviously, Quentin Grimes is a good shooter, even though he's coming to have a, ba- a bad year so far. He was 5-7, of seven, but the one that was really standing out to me was, was, uh, was Randle just bombing away. Anyway, the Hawks won a turnover battle in this game, as that's usually a good sign. Um, and the Hawks, again, shot well in twos, took care of the ball at a, at a very good level. They ended up with solid free throw numbers and solid, solid rebounding numbers overall as well. But the other swing part was that the Hawks were six of 36 from three. And as we'll get into uh, later on a little bit more, the Hawks have three shooters that I would describe on this roster as definitely above average in terms of their dynamism and their ability to shoot on the move and uh, just their kind of sniper status. And that's Griffin, Bogdanovich, and Trey. The three of them combined to shoot one of 22 from three. Um, I mean, what are you going to do with that? Obviously, Trey's having a bad shooting year overall, so that's that's part of this. But um, it is, you know, part of the factor there. Like, Bogey goes 0 of 10 from three. What are you going to do? AJ one of eight from three. What are you going to do? So a lot, a lot of stuff to like get into there. But at the same time, it was just you got to make shots, and they didn't make shots in this game. Um, that's all I have as far as the overall takeaways from this one. It's not as simple as make or miss league. Um, and I know people don't like that I say that. Some people uh, don't just don't like accept that. But I promise you, if you watch this game, or if or and or I should say, if you look at the box score, the entire game swings on that one column of three point shooting, and even just jump shooting in general. You could say if you want to broaden it out. But the Knicks, it's really hard for the Knicks in particular, this construction of a Knicks team to shoot as poorly as they did around the rim and not lose, much less <laughs> win by twenty four points. But here we are. All right, before we get into the rest of the show and my individual player breakdowns on this podcast, a word from our sponsors on the show. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, and December is now in full swing. The NBA season is rocking and rolling, bowls on the horizon, college football, and much more. Hockey stuff's going on to other action across the sports world. Bet Online is the number one source for wagering information they're looking for. That includes stats, news, and analysis this season. You can get the latest odds and trends for every pro and college league out there at Bet Online. That includes football and basketball and soccer and hockey and esports, golf, tennis, auto racing, and horse racing, as well as other sports. And Bet Online can also be very useful in engaging the latest on the Hawks. You have the nightly game odds and totals that you're looking for about the Hawks, as well as the futures market on the conference odds and title odds and individual award stuff. Beyond that, Bet Online is also the fastest and easiest way to get your sports betting fixed. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online as well. Check out Bet Online right now on your mobile device or your computer to learn more about all the trends and the action in the sports world. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right. And uh, this will be probably a little bit shorter show than usual, as you might expect, for a blowout loss with injuries and all that fun stuff. But to the bench in this game. Akongwu played uh, 24 minutes. He had 10 points, 6 rebounds. I thought he was okay. He wasn't fantastic. Got to the line eight times. Some of that was garbage time, but had a block. Thought he did his job for the most part. Didn't like get blown off the screen or anything like that. I thought he was fine. Uh, Justin Holiday came back after not playing for a while. Uh, he had five points on seven shots. Like like most guys did not shoot the ball well in this game, but I thought he was he looked okay. Had a steal and a block. He was active enough. Didn't get them killed. Um, Bogey, nine points on 17 junior possessions. Obviously, that's pretty bad. I don't worry about Bogey at all. He has a track record of years and years of being a great shooter. Um, these things happen. He's going to have bad shooting nights. He's coming back from a knee injury. He's not all the way back yet. He had a, he had a really good first half on uh, on Monday. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. But, obviously, he was damaging in this game, which is how bad he was at shooting. Just because, you know, 360 from the, from the – even 3 of 6 from, th- from 2 is not, like, you know, not, not terrible. But when you're 0 of 10 from 3, it's hard to uh, retain value. Aaron Holiday, after basically not playing – uh, mo- much for the last like two weeks, came in played a, played a ton out of necessity. Seven points, four assists, four rebounds. Had two block shots actually, which is kind of weird. Um, had two had two, two turnovers in this game. He didn't shoot it well either. Two of seven from the floor, one of five from three. I thought he did fine coming in spot duty. Um, so he had some moments that were probably a little bit a little, little bit too over aggressive. But I thought Aaron like you know checked the box of being a veteran who's ready to play and come in and kind of execute whenever you lose a guy like Murray and having him play thirty minutes. Like if you ask me how many minutes. 
um, Aaron Holly's going to play in this game. And, I, and then I, I would have answered something, you, you probably zero or single digits, and he ended up playing 30. So there, there you go on that. Uh, Jarrett Culver played le- played less in this game, didn't have as much juice. In fact, it seemed like Nate went away from him in the first half, even though, even when it was competitive, kind of went on uh, different directions. Uh, 105 from the floor, 02 from three. Culver's lack of shooting is still stark. Uh, he did take two and was uh, confident in shooting them, just missed them both. So uh, he's just not being guarded a whole lot. And then Veet had a really, really rough third quarter, but was uh, sorry, first quarter, but was better after that. I thought he was like, you know, settled in, had a couple nice flashes, had seven points an assist, three rebounds, and a steal. Made two threes. How about that? Uh, Veet was two of two from three. <laughs> so the rest of the team was four of 34. And then you throw in the one, uh, also, Joan Johnson was one of one. So two guys who I would describe as, they're not non-shooters, but they're definitely, uh, let's say, below average three-point shooters. Jalen and Veet were a combined three of three, and the rest of the team's three, three of 33. So that's, uh, that's pretty wild stuff. And the Kaminsky play garbage time. We'll leave, we'll leave that there um, for now. Obviously, Murray played four minutes. We won't really focus on that. Um, Jalen just fouls all over the place. Uh, Nate kind of you know let, let him off the hook a little bit after the game, talking about how ba- Randall's a tough matchup for him. It's the case. I mean, I did think that he got a, a pretty uh, brutal whistle. To be fair to Jalen, um, you know, a lot of fouls for young guys on a huge surprise. But I think at least two of them were pretty shaky. Let's just say so. That's part of it too. You got to learn how to play with fouls, and that's part of development as well. He had a, actually had a good start to the third quarter offensively, but that was kind of all he had going for him in this game. Uh, Capella was probably the only bright spot in the starting lineup, honestly. I thought he played very well, 13 points, 11 rebounds, and uh, in 22 minutes on seven shots, finished around the rim, did Capella things. And as mentioned before, the Knicks got basically nothing at the rim in this game. And that was, uh, as usual, a credit to Clint. But uh, he wasn't, like, dominant. He just played pretty well and was probably their best player in this game. And then uh, AJ just didn't have a good a good night overall. Nine points on thirteen shots, actually 14, fourteen shooting possessions, including the free throw line. He was two of five on twos and one of eight on threes. Um, obviously, he's had a couple of these now in recent days. He was probably unsustainably hot from two point range early in the season. Three point range, I don't worry about at all for AJ. He's going to have better nights than this, but uh, did have two assists and a steal. But he'll have uh, you know he was below average like as as most guys were in this game. And then Trey. So I wanted to end here. Trey, the numbers don't look terrible. 19 points, six assists, four rebounds on 20 shots. He was not a 20 from the floor. He was not 16 on two, which is pretty good, actually. Oh, four from three and four turnovers. But look, I mean, I've talked about it on, on the show on Monday. Trey's got to be better. Uh, he's, he's getting dunked on right now quite a bit nationally for, I guess he wore like a King of Broadway thing on his shoes. And obviously he's been good at MSG in the past. He was not good in this game, nor was most other people. So it wasn't like it was just Trey, but he has to be better. Obviously, there are other concerns with his team, the shooting, the injuries, all of that stuff. It's all wrapped into one. It's not only Trey, but he's not having a good season by his standards. And that continued in this game. He was defensively quite bad at times. Uh, he's usually you know, below average, obviously, but he was uh, notably bad in transition a few times in this game. He was inefficient. And his shooting numbers for the season are really rough. I don't know if the shoulders bother him from three point range. That might be notable, but he he's sub thirty percent now from three for the season. Um, and yeah, I mean he's got to be better. Obviously, that's on on the list. It's not the entire list of things that has to be better for the for this Hawks team. They got they have to get healthy. Uh, we'll see about Murray. They have to get three point shooting going, etc. But Trey is near the top of the list. Like as the Hawks, simply put, the Hawks are not a contender for a top four, five, six seed in the East if Trey is going to play like he has played in his first 23 games of the season. I know he, he missed two games, so that's 23 for him, 25 for the team. If this is the Trey that they get all season long, the Hawks will not be good this year. They, they, they'll probably be fine still, as, we, as they've been so far. They've been a 500-ish team, but they are not going to be a threat for a threat to do anything if Trey is this guy. Um, obviously, that applies to a lot of different things, but it is the case, and when you are uh, the superstar and the team wins, you get a lot of credit, and justifiably so. If you're a superstar and the team loses, you should get some blame, especially if you're not playing well, and Trey's not playing well. So there you go. Okay. Now, from here, uh, the Hawks stay in New York. They have the day off on Thursday. I'm sure they will probably have a walkthrough or practice of some sort. Uh, and that's not been announced at this point in time. And they play the Nets on Friday. The Nets are playing pretty well, actually, in recent days. They won tonight, beating the Hornets. They are staying in New York as well. So no advantage there, even though with no travel for the Hawks. The Nets are actually 14 and 12. They have a better record than the Hawks do. They're 9 and 5 um, at home this season. Kevin Durant is Kevin Durant. Kyrie had a good game tonight, so they are uh, basically back to close to full strength. Ben Simmons is supposedly going to play in that game on Friday. Uh, TJ Warren is back in a limited role for the Nets, so um, the Hawks will be underdogs in that game, provided everybody plays. Um, We'll see about Murray. 
we'll see about Hunter, who uh, seemed, uh, I think it was on the ESPN broadcast tonight. I know there were two broadcasts with ESPN and Valley Sports Southeast. And by the way, if you missed it on Monday, I, I, wish, I shouted out about my friend Bob Rathman. Uh, he was uh, not obviously with the team again in New York tonight, but Mike Conti filled in admirably for him. Good job by Mike. Um, but there was ESPN broadcast as well. And DeAndre did an interview with them and said like he was hoping to be back in the next two games. Um, Friday is one of those games against the Nets, against the Nets and they come back home on Sunday. Um, the fact that Hunter went on the trip means it's at least plausible in my mind that he plays on Friday. I wouldn't bank on that because it's like that's like eight days after the injury announcement. But he could be back as soon as Friday. We'll see about that. I, if I, at this moment in time, I probably would guess Murray doesn't play, but we'll see. Uh, Collins will not be playing, so that's an, at least, there'll, there'll be at least one guy down, and uh, the Nets are challenging to defend. So we'll see how that all goes. I'm planning to do a, a podcast between now and Friday, so hopefully that comes to fruition. Please subscribe to this podcast across podcast platforms. I will have uh, more content coming in the coming days, and if you listen to the podcast this far in a blowout loss, I know you are a diehard, so I thank you for your support. Please leave five-star ratings and reviews. Check out the show across platforms apple spotify stitcher tuning radio google play uh, odyssey app all those places and uh thank you again one more time for listening to the podcast we'll see you guys later in the week